Well, I want to welcome you to our exploration of the Gospel of John. And we're going to be exploring chapter 8. And whenever we enter the Word of God, we always want to do that accompanied by the Holy Spirit. So let's solicit His presence among us. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this opportunity to gather. We acknowledge that in Your kingdom there are no accidents, coincidences. We're all here by Your divine appointment. And it's our prayer that Your purposes would be accomplished in each of us. As we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen. Okay, session eight. We happen to be in chapter eight. And so, just a review from last session, chapter seven. You may remember the night before where we are, there had been a meeting of the Sanhedrin. And people were divided in their opinion as to whether or not Jesus was the Messiah. Some bought it, some didn't, and there was a big divisive movement there. And Nicodemus, who's on the Sanhedrin, defended him. It's a key point that we're going to get into here. And uh, verse 50 and 51 of chapter 7 from last time, just to get an overlap here a little bit. Nicodemus saith unto them, he's the guy that came by night, being one of them, remember chapter 3, doth our law judge any man before it hear him? And know what he doeth? So that's, he's raising a very rational question. And uh, so he's the, he's, uh, it's been a year and a half, if you will, since chapter 3 approximately. And chapter 3, it was, he came to Jesus by, at midnight. And you can regard this little glimmer as maybe twilight, because it's clear that it, it, there's awakening going on here if it hasn't completely happened already. And by the time we get to chapter 19 we'll see that there's daylight in his soul. So we're almost going from midnight to twilight to daylight in terms of his apparent relationship with the Messiah. And so uh, be that as it may. Now, meanwhile, everyone else had gone home. Apparently no one invited him, and we don't have any record of that. But early in the morning, that's emphasized in the Greek transcript we're going to see, early in the morning he came back to Jerusalem, went back to the temple, and sat down to teach. And uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, we talked about that last time, has just ended. But it is one of the three feasts that every able-bodied Jew was required to attend in Jerusalem. So it's holiday time. And it just even though the seven-day thing had just ended, obviously there's a huge crowd, and Jesus is taking advantage of that by going to the temple very early to teach. And so Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to hear him, and he sat down and taught them. And so uh, early in the morning, it's interesting that the Greek term there implies it was before sunrise. And uh, so uh, and the scripture does tell us to begin each day, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Well, he's doing it very literally, obviously. And uh, so uh, it, uh, he sat down. That may sound strange to our custom, but you understand that was the formal posture for the teacher to take. Uh, the word in the Greek really means sitting. And uh, it's the position of authority for a teacher of the law. And he did that at the well in Matthew 4, verses 6. He did it at the Sermon on the Mount. You'll be sensitive to that. He does that at the point of authority. And he also he will do it in the upper room. And we'll encounter the John, John's account of that as we go forward here. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had, and she's apparently caught her in the act, which is, raises a number of questions. Where's the husband? Or where's the guy, I should say? Uh, so they brought a woman taken adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, visualize the crowd, he's there to teach, and they bring this woman adultery, pop her right in the middle of all this, and they said, to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. If I was there, I'd say, gee, how'd she, she was able to do that all by herself? That's kind of a new thing. And so uh, put her in the midst, and... Uh, and by the way, this is the only place the scribes are even mentioned in this gospel. They were copiers of the law and so forth. So this is, this is a setup, obviously, to put Jesus on the spot from several points of view. Not only is he going to enforce the Mosaic law, which means she should be stoned, he's also dealing with the issue of Rome because Rome had denied them capital punishment. So no matter which way, he, he, he it's, it's a setup. They figure there's no way out of this one. They've got him trapped to be, if nothing else, unpopular. Either he won't enforce the law, which is 
an, uh, improper, or if he enforces the law, he's got problems with Rome, etc. See, so and the question we sort of ask ourselves as we're watching all this: Where's the husband? And uh, he apparently wasn't at the temple there. And why wasn't this taken to the Jewish officials first? No, it's the officials bringing it to him, so to speak. And uh, so, the adulteress. This is the first eleven verses of this chapter, and it has some complications. I'll get to in a minute, but. This is what we would call in our legal system entrapment and uh, to present Jesus in a no-win situation. And uh, this situation would seem to follow the miscarriage of yesterday, uh, uh, last session's plans. Remember, they had the officers sent out and they hadn't come back and making excuses and that, that attempt failed. And so the snare here, this is the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booze. It's a crowded holiday season to the point... And in that kind of, and in the Feast of Booths, they camped in these makeshift uh, booths that are designed to, they, they do what we would consider camping. They had to, uh, for that week, live in this, uh, not in their permanent place, in these temporary dwellings to remind them of the wilderness wanderings. Well, that kind of celebration just leads itself to all kinds of misbehavior. And so it's a, it was a time you can imagine this kind of thing might be, if it's going to happen, it's going to be very prevalent. So they, they got, this is a setup, obviously. We don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if we found out that the man involved was set up to catch her for this, you follow what I'm saying? So, okay. So, so this is a camp atmosphere and temptation was everywhere. And uh, it takes two to tangle, as we say in the States. I don't know what equivalent terms you have here in, in uh, uh, New Zealand, but uh, the... Uh, uh, both were, should have been stoned, in concept here at least. And so uh, it takes two to tangle, as we would say. Verse 5, now Moses in the law, this is what they're instructing him, they're calling his attention to. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Now this is what's called in, in uh, a theater, the plot. This is the problem, this is the point, this is the... The, the problem to be solved. How is he going to get out of this one? If he goes left or right, he's, he's stuck no matter which way he's going to go. And one thing you will learn as you study your gospel, he's always in charge. And uh, it, I just love some of these confrontations. And we're going to. And by the way, we happen to be in a chapter that's leading up, in my mind, to one of the biggest confrontations in the Bible. And we'll get to that shortly. But uh, the point here is the illegality of the actions. She should have been taken to their court. She being here is illegal, by the way. Okay, the accusers themselves technically are now accomplices by not having done that, if you will. And so, uh, st there's this, there's a whole pet set passage of stoning for a betrothed woman. It doesn't have to be married to make it wrong. Just betrothed is enough, and so forth. And death was supposed to be for both of them participating. And so, it's a profound problem, more so on, than you may realize on the surface. And one of the questions you might just ask yourself, let's assume you were faced with this. How, would, how should we stand? She was guilty. Her guilt or innocence isn't really an issue, is it? That doesn't, she obviously, apparently, caught in the act. There is no defense that uh, is being misunderstood. How would we have handled that is the question. Because those are, we, we in our lives will have equivalent kinds of confrontations. And they're now before... A very interesting person. You see, the reason we want to examine that is we're in the same shoe as she is. We're also guilty before the Lord. So we, we suddenly have an equity in how this is dealt with because we're in her shoes too. How can justice and mercy be harmonized? That question is what the entire Bible deals with. From the sins of Adam and Eve all the way through, the trauma of Job and his problems, all the way through. What, how, does, how does God resolve being absolutely just, not compromising justice, and yet ex what basis can he exercise mercy? And so, moving on, verse 6. This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But <laughs> I love this. Jesus won't play their game. He stooped down and with his finger 
wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now, this is his finger wrote on the ground. This is an interesting finger. Do you know what else that finger wrote? The Ten Commandments in stone. It was his finger. And he's going to declare that before the chapter's over. Most people don't realize that. People who love Christ and are Christian don't realize he was the voice of the burning bush. He was, was his finger. And how many times did he have to do that? Twice. And we'll notice here he does it in two sessions. Interestingly enough, I think it's interesting. He is finger wrote in the ground. And uh, so, you know, instead of passing judgment on the woman, Jesus is going to pass judgment on the judges. Okay? So we have the writing by the lawgiver himself, the finger of God, if I can indulge that, from Exodus 31 and so forth. Okay. A couple of passages that you might find interesting from the Old Testament in Jeremiah 17, verse 13. It reads, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. This gets at a question that everybody asks and no one's quite sure. What was it that he was writing? We don't know. It doesn't tell us what he was writing. We can make some pretty good guesses. But step one, let's realize we don't know what he wrote. We're, we're, we're in the area of conjecture here. Okay? And uh, Psalm 90, verse 8 says, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. I joined those commentators who suspect, we don't know, we suspect that what he did was write down their sins. As they looked over his shoulder to see what he was writing, he would write something that they didn't realize he knew. And they decided, they, they remembered another appointment they had and slipped away. And one by one, we, I, I suspect, he said something that was convicting. In fact, we know that from the text, as you'll see that convicted them to drop their stone and get out of there. And so, so uh, secret sin on the earth is open scandal in heaven, of course. Now, verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that's without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And I think it's fascinating. It was in sort of two, two groups here. But in any case, um, so the uh, so he wrote. Remember, he wrote the commandments in Exodus uh, the second time, also, by the way. And what did he write? The seventh commandment, adultery, might have been one of them. The name of the man she was with. I don't see why. the The list of sins of the accusers is my guess, but that's a guess. And let he that is without sin demonstrates the spirit of the law. I could not destroy the Torah, but to fulfill, he says, and so forth. Anyway, when they heard it. Being convicted by their own conscience, whatever it was he was writing convicted them of their own sin. Let's see, without sin comes me first. And one by one, they, they chose to, never mind. And uh, so one, went one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. That implies the oldest went first, because that's maybe the way he was, he was dealing with them. Some guy looking over, he was mentioning, probably wrote the, himself the mistress that no one knew he had. Ooh, I'm out of here, you know. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. In other words, everybody else vacated. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And uh, now, by the way, this conviction we see in verse 9 seems to be the springboard for Jesus' subsequent declaration he's going to get at here by the time you get to verse 12, I am the light of the world. You're going to discover, if you study this chapter carefully, many commentators don't pick up on this, the incident with a woman taken in adultery and his subsequent I am the light of the world, which is going to occupy the rest of the chapter pretty much, are not unrelated. One sets up the other, if you will. And the, the, the uh, conviction in verse 9 will lead to the declaration, I'm the light of the world, in verse 12, which then occasions subsequent violence in verse 41. So 
it really is the core of the whole chapter. It's not just an incident that happened to occur earlier. No, it's all tied together, actually. One leads to the other. And so convicted by their own conscience, I think that's critical to the whole thing. And uh, she said, uh, who's, who's there? Where are you accusing? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And one of the provocative questions I ask, did she? Nobody knows. Dostoevsky in his, in his uh, novel called uh, uh, Brothers Karamazov dwells on that ambiguity in the Russian church. They have a thing to deal with it. But the truth is we don't know what happened to her subsequently. We'd like to believe she followed what he said, but we don't know. And uh, Dostoevsky in his novel makes the point that it really takes marriage to, to protect a person from these kinds of sins. And so, so none but the woman. See, it required two witnesses, by the way. And no, there are no two witnesses, so there, he's under the law of Moses, not stoning her. And, and so, that, by the way, the witnesses from Deuteronomy 17, the witnesses must assist in carrying out the sentence. If they're going to stone her, the witnesses have to be part of the action. They, they've split. So it's interesting how these impossible situations yield so skillfully. But we shouldn't be surprised. Look who's quarterbacking everything. And one of the things we're going to emphasize when we get to the second half of the Gospel of John is a discovery that many commentators miss. And that is every detail all the way through that last week is being done at the tempo that Jesus is orchestrating every step. And I'll show you that as we go. But to go and sin no more, she, he, he, she says, he says. Okay. Now, Neither do I condemn thee, he says, and that you for there you might put in your notes Romans 8 from verse 3 and following. And note the order, go and sin no more. Was she saved? We don't really know, but there's a clue. She called him what? Lord, which is interesting. And uh, he condemned sin, but he accepted the sinner. We get that backwards. We love the sin and hate the sinner. That sounds shocking, but if you examine our own behavior, you'll see that. We make, we, we, in, in our entertainment industries, we celebrate sin. Yet we find someone's sin and, oh, I have bad news. That's true, of, that is true of homosexuality. We should, we should hate the sin, but love the sinner. Christ died for them. We forget that. We need to understand that. And we don't want to reverse and condemn the sinner and accept the sin. Here's a concrete case where a guilty sinner no doubt about her guilt. Her guilty sinner leaves the presence of Christ uncondemned. It's documented. There it is right there. You can't escape that. It's real. It deserves a careful study. There is a textual problem I should acquaint you with from chapter the end of chapter 7, from verse 53 through the verse we just finished. That passage is missing in some of the ancient manuscripts. And because of that, there's all kinds of scholastic comment. It was omitted in the New uh, English Bible and it was disclaimed in the NIV. But there's a number of scholars, and I side with them, that believe it's legitimate never the, never the, nevertheless. There are continuity problems in the text if you take that out. It's missing in some of the manuscripts, okay. And there's a reason by, uh, we'll see in a minute, I forget who, um, that it was removed because some people thought it might encourage immorality. Some early church guys did. So, uh, But the, uh, you would have continuity problems here. Then spake them, who to when? It raises questions, more questions. Having this in here is consistent with the rest of the chapter in concept, that, a concept that most people don't follow. And it's fascinating to me when you study the epistle of Hebrews. Many commentators spend all their time as to who really wrote it. You can prove Paul wrote it, but let's set that aside. There are some people, they get all hung up with who really wrote it, and in their commentaries they miss the point of the letter. I was fascinated to discover very few really understand the letter, and the ones that really understand the letter are the ones that focus on the letter, not the authorship. When you know Paul wrote it, it happens to go easier, but that's not that's another issue. So consistency here is a big issue. And so it's Augustine that highlights this, the, uh, s the speculation that uh, some people, because they're weak in faith, they're afraid they might, this might encourage uh, uh, immorality. But um, it, this whole thing is consistent with the design of the gospel. John 5 was the impotent man. It was a sermon text there. 
Uh, John 6 was the manna thing, bread of life thing. John 7 was the water from the rock under tabernacles, the living water. And John 8 will be the pillar of fire, light of the world forthcoming. And it fits that too. And so it sets the whole stage for that. In the, uh, it's cited in the third century document as biblical grounds for accepting penitents who have been dis- it is It's documented in the third century. So it's been, it's around the idea that it was, it doesn't mean it was added, it was deleted, is the point, what we know from that. And so uh, it's con- it is considered authentic by Jerome, Ambrose, and Augustine, which are pillars of the early church. So it's, to me, there, it's not really an issue, but I want you just to be aware of the fact that some people say, well, we're not sure that was in there. Well, that's up to them. You've got a problem. That's fine. But it's interesting to realize that what we're watching here isn't just teaching for us as individuals. It also is profiling the problem of the nation Israel. And we'll discover there's a sort of almost a second agenda unfolding in this gospel. And it, the abject condition of the nation is profiled. And as it does so, it profiles us, ourselves. I'll show you what I mean. In chapter 1, they had an ignorance of the forerunner. They, were, they had blindness to his presence. In chapter 2, there was a, jo- a joyless state, desecration of the Father's house and all of that. Uh, third chapter, we, we, they were dead in sins and needed to be born again was the issue there. Uh, in the fourth chapter, there was a callous indifference to the Gentile neighbors. Uh, in chapter 5, we saw an impotent that was blind, halt, and withered that was healed. And... Uh, uh, in chapter 6, they were hungry, had, but had no appetite for the bread of life. In chapter 7, we had the officers that were sent to arrest Christ, but didn't show up and do that. And then in 8, we have uh, a focus on Israel as the adulterous wife of Yorevavhe, and, uh, 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 and so forth. So these are profiles that, that emerge about the nation. And as we lay that out, we're not picking on the nation. We're guilty of each one of those. We, uh, we're blinded to his presence. We desecrate our father's house, we dead in sins, the need to be born again, the callous indifference to Gentile neighbors, the, the fact that we're impotent in many ways, we need to be healed. Um, we have no appetite for the bread of life. This, we're all guilty here. And uh, so forth. So there's a double parallel going on here that is, is uh, uh, very provocative. And there's several places where it really links to Israel specifically. The impotent man was impotent for how many years? 38 years. That's how many years they wandered in the wilderness impotent. Uh, it's for due to a lack of faith. Anyway, let's move on to verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Those are glib phrases, but they're profound as can be. We need to really understand that. And um, this is the second I am that we see, the ego I me thing. And it certainly fits the first 11 verses. And uh, so, I am the light of the world. This is why many the, the text seems to highlight that he started before twi- at sunrise. He's the light of the world. He, st- he would start when? In a Jewish mind. At the, the uh, at Boker, the, the, uh, the morning, and so forth. And so, light of the world. Now, the other thing, the light, you probably don't connect it, but I should point out, remind you, what we talked about, the Feast of Tabernacles, is climaxed with a light parade. And uh, so uh, the, the, the light there is in the court of women. There stood four golden candelabras, each with four bowls, and it illuminated the entire city according to some records. And uh, so the light is associated with the Feast of Tabernacle. It's part of their celebration. But it also gives rise to, I am the light of the world. You see, that they're not unrelated. He's, he's, celebrating, he's doing this on, on that holiday. In fact, there's a whole, he does this seven times. I am the bread of life. We heard that back in chapter 6. I am the light of the world here in chapter 8. I am the door he's going to talk about in, in um, John 10. And uh, I am the good shepherd also in John 10. I am the resurrection and the life in chapter 11. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's in the upper room discourse in John 14. And then I am the vine, ye are the branches in, uh, in his, great, in his uh, famous uh, vineyard thing in, in uh, John 15. So how many of those were there? Huh? Seven. Yeah, everybody says seven. It was seven, but there's also actually eight, which spoils some people's outlines, but I'll leave that alone. Okay. Anyway, the previous day, remember he said there was no, there were no prophet came from Galilee. We pointed out that was wrong, right? The Messiah is as a light to the Gentiles, is prophesied in Isaiah 42 and 49 and 60 and in Malachi 4. Those are not surprises to the Old Testament mind. It's, it may 
hit us strange, but that's because we haven't done our homework in the Old Testament. And is this light unto the Gentiles? Does this mean he's for universalism? Absolutely not. He's light only to those to the believers, and that's going to also come out as we go forward here. So, but darkness is without excuse. And if you want to track that one down, the first two chapters of the Book of Romans is probably in one of the most challenging intellectual papers ever written on the planet Earth by Paul, the Book of Romans. In chapter 1 and 2, set a foundation that is bulletproof. And I challenge you to get into that. We move on to verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said to him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Very similar to a speech of the last session in John chapter 7, as you may recall. Okay. He continues, Ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man, yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. And uh, see, it's interesting. The way they judged the woman taken in adultery proved that they neither understood the law nor their own sinful hearts. Both are, they're guilty in both points. And since they wanted to use the law to condemn the woman to trap the Savior, Jesus also used the law to answer them. And he quoted a principle found in Deuteronomy 17 and, and 19, as well as number 35, that the testi testimony of two men was required to validate a judgment. And that was his point here. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. And so... Uh, and those are the verses I just quoted, Deut Deuteronomy 17 and 19, and you can get those out of your notes, that's fine. And then they, said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. He's using language here that's very foreign to them. He's speaking of God as his father. An Orthodox Jew wouldn't do that. They don't call their chief rabbi father call them other things, but you, you follow me? We, uh, don't confuse some of our modern nomenclature. This is, this, is, this is rare stuff here. There's only one time that Jesus didn't refer to him as Father. And that was when he hung on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why would he bellow that out? Because he was in our shoes. Where is thy father? They are highlighting what they perceive is his illegitimacy. We miss that when you read the polite King James in chapter 19, verse 19. They said, uh, they, then said to him, where is thy father? What are they, they, that, that's not a question of where is he located. They're accusing him of being illegitimate, a bastard in the street vernacular and worse. Where's thy father? They're highlighting what they perceive is his illegitimacy. They're assuming that he was born of fornication. And they're going to get right to that in verse 41 when we get there. This is, this is starting to build up. That's one of the reasons, I guess, I find chapter 8 so fascinating. Because the tempo is, if you were doing a movie here of this, you would have to, if you're doing it accurately, increase the tension between the two parties, between the Pharisee. This is not polite anymore. It is getting increasingly vituperative. And so this leads us to Psalm 69. So I'm going to pause here because I want us to take a quick look at the Psalms. It may surprise you, those of you that are interested in prophecy, the most pregnant book in the Bible for insights is the book of Psalms. It's astonishing to discover how in every nook and cranny there are little clues and little things put there that if you do it devotionally, you start picking up and connecting things that seem out of context, and yet they're not. They're very profound. And uh, so the, it turns out Psalm 69 is the one I want to take a look at, and it's a surprise to most people who know the Psalms because they haven't looked at it carefully. The silent years in the life of Christ are hinted at here. It's a great messianic psalm. It's a psalm of David, of course. And it, it, uh, it appears to deal with some of the, the silent, what we call the silent years. Now, 
at, uh, of, of Jesus' childhood and his young manhood, of which we find no mention, with one exception, we find nothing in the Gospels about. We know all about the birth, and we jump right in when he starts his ministry. With one exception, Luke gives us a little incident when he was 12 years old. And, uh, uh, where, but other than that little incident most of us have heard, we know very little. And so this psalm fills in some of these details, I believe. Now, we're going to begin up north. We're in Jerusalem now, but we're going to, in our mind's eye, go to Nazareth. And uh, we can almost hear the sob of a small boy. And uh, you get a picture. And we, he, as we see him go from a small child to, through teenage, get the, get the picture here. It's a small town. It's a Jewish town that the common belief is that Jesus is illegitimate. Mary was pregnant before she was married. That wasn't hidden. Can you imagine how that was, in, you, know how, you know how forgiving a small town is? No comment, okay. You also understand how unforgiving kids are. Can you imagine the kids coming home from school, so to speak? Well, nobody knows who Jesus' daddy is. They, they all had a common mother and a common father. But the one, we're not sure who his father is. Can you, the kids, can you, can you imagine how vicious, how gossipy, how, can you imagine a kid growing up in that environment? These are dark, we all know about the dark hours on the cross. We've seen the movies, we've dwelt on that in the devotion. That occurred in what, three, four, five, six hours, one afternoon. What about the 30 years growing up in Nazareth? Every day. And uh, now the Psalm 69 is classified in some, as a precatory psalm for some certain verses we're not going to get into. I'll leave that alone. There's a whole other aspect to this we'll leave out there. And uh, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll leave that go. There's another section of it, verse 22 to 28, that, that is a whole other issue that I, I don't want to get into here. But let's just take a look at a few of these verses from the front end. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I seek in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dry. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. Remember, this is a psalm. This is a hymn that they sing. They that hate me without cause ooh, are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored to that which I took not away. Whatever is the issue here, he's getting abuse, isn't he? It's interesting in John 15, Jesus will quote this verse and apply it to himself. We'll get that when we get to John 15. You know, this comes to pass that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. He quotes this in John 15. In Romans 3, being justified freely by His grace through redemption, that is in Christ Jesus. Justified freely. This is, this is where you get, being justified freely is the same as being justified without a cause. The Lord did not find any merit in me. He justified me without a cause within me. I was justified freely, thanks to Him. That's the parallel I'm making here. This psalm tells us that they hated Jesus without a cause. They hated him without a cause that we might be justified without a cause. Okay? But continue verse 5. O God, thou knowest my foolishness and my sins are not hid from thee. And this is the same thing that he pre is praying about in Gethsemane, but that's a whole other issue. And so how can you apply this to the Lord? Well, he was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. But in the last few hours on the cross... Second Chronicles 5.21 tells us he became sin for us. We, that's, a, that's a heavy turn, a, a statement in, in the New Testament. Key, very key. And, uh, and he prayed, remember in Gethsemane, let this cup pass me. And that's what he's talking about is this cup, that, that, that burden, the cup of sin. That was your cup of sin and mine that he had to uh, bear. But moving on here to get to where you where I want to go. Let them not wait on thee, O Lord, a God of hosts. Be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. 
because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame have covered my face. And uh, what shame could he be talking about? Hmm? But this is the verse that I think starts to raise the fog here as what's in focus here. This verse tells us a lot that we would not know otherwise. I have become a, I'm a stranger to my brethren and an alien to my mother's children. Well, why is there a distinction? You mean father's children or mother's children? See, his brothers, they all share a common mother. They don't apparently share a common father. Okay? And James, Judas, and Joseph said, Mother, we heard somebody that Jesus is not really our brother. I'm just a hypothetical thing. And they said that nobody knows who his father is. It must have been really interesting for two of those guys, James and Jude, after the resurrection to discover he wasn't some lunatic or whatever. He really was the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. Can you imagine? James and Jude are two books you really want. There's two guys you really want to get to know in the New Testament. And we say James, it's really Jacob, but I won't start that issue. The point is, but it's interesting. Most people don't know the nickname of what James was called in the early church. We have writings among the church fathers. They talk about James. Do you know what nickname they gave him? I love this. Camel knees, exactly. Old camel knees. He spent so much time on prayer. They made, they, they, kidded about that. Anyway, Mary had other children, obviously, and that confirms the record in the Gospels. He became alien to his mother's children, not his father's children, because Joseph was not his father. They were really what we would call half-brothers and half-sisters. And uh, I'm suggesting that it must have been a very unhappy home. He grew up in that cloud in a culture that made a big thing of that cloud. And as an impressionable kid, boy. But something that's also don't want you to overlook is this verse teaches the virgin birth. Sort of an elliptical way, but it testifies to that. And, uh, and I'm becoming more and more convinced that the virgin birth is not an optional doctrine. If you're serious about Christ, you need to be serious about that whole issue. And if you have doubts about it, dig into it and study it and discover why the virgin birth. There's a whole bunch of reasons. And, uh, and in Matthew 20, this is not the carpenter's son, and is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren, James, Joseph, Simon, see, they're named in the Gospels. He had four brothers. We know he had at least two sisters. We don't know their names. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, are not his sisters, plural, with us? We don't know their names. We know there's more than one. Were there two or 17? We have no idea. But there were other kids. They obviously had other children. Mary and Joseph did after the virgin birth. And then Psalm 69, I, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the approaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. And this is a verse which the Lord quoted in reference to the temple. Okay? And uh, we got that in John chapter 2, you may recall, that he quotes there uh, that whole episode on the temple, the oxen and so forth, and he scourged them drove them out, take these things, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And then he quotes, in John 2, 17, he quotes, his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So the disciples connected the events of the cleansing of the temple with Psalm 69. Okay. Here it goes. And when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. When he did something spiritually appropriate, they criticized him for it. Put it in our vernacular. I made sac sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb unto them. So when he's devotional, they make fun of him. When he, see, they, they're, they're inverting whatever he's doing. See, I wept and chased my soul with fasting, and that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth my garment, and I became a proverb to them. And so whenever he'd fast or weep or whatever, the brothers would make fun of him. They'd ridicule for him. They would assume, presumably, they're just putting on an act of some kind. And uh, so, I became a proverb to him. What proverb was being circulated about him? That he was illegitimate. He was a bastard. And uh, that was the term that we would use today in our thing. 
and we're going to see this confrontation come to a crisis. That's why I'm spending my time on this. Because by the time we get verse 41, the Pharisees are going to say to the we were not born of fornication. So this lurking issue isn't just for those 30 years in Nazareth. It's coming to a boil right here in the temple. Okay. But here's the one that really gets to me for some reason. Verse 12. He says, they that sit at the gate, and remember a gate was like town hall. A gate of the city is where the elders met. That's where they greeted visitors. That was, that's equivalent to what we think of as city hall in our, our, our culture. They that sit at the gate speak against me. And I was the song of the drunkards. Really? The drunkards at the local bar made up dirty little ditties about him and his mother. That's what he lived with. Could he speak against it? Of course not. What was his defense? How does he deal with that? Not for a few months, a few years, no. For his life. Through childhood, through a, uh, through, till up to his... All the way. So, now, why did he endure all this? We have no idea what he put up with for those 30 years. He did that so that you and I would have clear title to be a son of God. He was raised in a town where he was called illegitimate in order that I might be a legitimate son of God. He did that for me. The Son of God bore that for me on the cross. He paid the penalty for my sin. He was sinless, but he paid for my sin. He was more legitimate than any. He has the most distinguished family tree in the history of man. And it's well documented all through the Bible. That's why there's so much emphasis on genealogy. There's much to study in those areas. But he has the most distinguished genealogy in, in the entire human thing. And the uh, most distinguished family tree in history. It was encrypted in the Torah in Genesis 38. It was prophesied in the Judges back in Ruth 4. It evades a blood curse on Jeconiah, and it's a whole fascinating study to get into sometime. The virgin birth. Very, very important study to master. I'll leave that to you to dig up. Anyway, continuing here. The treasury was in the woman's court, by the way. It's the area called the treasury. It was in the woman's court. And it was that's where they took the woman that was... The adultery thing in the first 11 verses took place. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour has not yet come. We're going to see that phrase, his hour has not yet, echo all the way through here until we get to one day where he not only permits it, he arranges it. And boy, that's a big deal. And we'll, we'll pick up a lot of that from Luke 19 and some other things. So the treasury, that's uh, probably the most popular area in the temple. In the forecourt of the women. There were 13 bronze chests, nine for taxes and four for offerings and so forth. His hour was not yet come, and that's going to echo all through. It echoed several times in chapter 7 and it's in here, and it's going to be in chapter 10 again. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and ye shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he saith, whither I go, he cannot come. It sounds to them like he's kind of contemplating suicide, and suicide was in their mind certain damnation. That was their presumption. And he says, ye shall seek me and not find me with you. So forth. That's, a, that's an echo that's going to continue here. And uh, so, ye shall die in your sins. That t t term uh, is here. It is plural. To die in this state implies eternal separation from God. No, atten no atonement made for unbelievers. And he said to them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said, Therefore unto you, ye shall die in your sins. If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And so, this is, this, this, uh, ye are from beneath, and I am from above. And those are terms, they are as contrasting as you can contrast in the Greek. See, I'm, you're from beneath as far as you can go beneath. I'm from above as far as you can go. That's, that, that's the rhetorical uh, tool being used here. I am not of this world. And uh, we find the same thought in, sec, in first Chronicles, uh, first Corinthians 2.14. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. And so, he said, I therefore, you, I, I, he says, I am here. Here's another one of those. 
Ego I me is the Old Testament name of God. Okay? And, uh, and Deuteronomy 32 and Isaiah 43. And notice sins again is the plural. And that's uh, the Christian dies in the Lord because he lives in the Lord. But the unbeliever dies in his sins because he lives in his sins. And so, but they said unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. There's continuing tying himself to the Father. And uh, the question always comes up, you know, can a person be saved on his deathbed? And the answer is absolutely. If he accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior, that's the whole issue. Now, what does that mean that to be done? But a person can reject Christ too long, just as the Jews did. If you reject Christ, it gets to the point where you can't backtrack, it turns out. It's just life. And uh, Now, his answer is always the same, that he is, he is consistent all the way through. He consistently proclaims that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Anyone who says Jews never said he was God has never read anything in John. Any, all through, it's all through here. And anyway, we continuing here, verse 27. They understood not that he spake unto them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And so they see, they missed the whole point. You see, they are of the earth. They do not understand heavenly things. When ye, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man. Don't miss that. That's an allusion to the cross. That's coming. He's making reference to it, as, and they obviously don't understand what he's talking about. And uh, the second of three references to the cross, we had one in chapter 3. We have this one. We'll have another one more explicit in chapter 12. And then uh, he says, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man. Now, that's a strange phrase that he uses in a very special way. He's really echoing Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. But I see him also, John here is echoing something that he witnessed on Patmos. I think that I think this gospel was written after Patmos, and uh, he consistently links, of course, Jesus to the cross. What we need to understand is our kinsman redeemer. To be a kinsman redeemer had to be a man. We overlooked it. Is Jesus God? Absolutely. Is he man? All? Yes. He's also man. The early church had a real problem with that for a while until they settled that all out. And uh, in Revelation chapter five, we're in the throne room of the universe. And we're right in the middle of a mystery thr thr thriller, actually. He and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Seven sealed book has been introduced, okay? Then you get to verse, And no man in heaven or on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Now, you and I don't understand what's going on, but John did. Because his eyes sobbed convulsively. Is what it says. Then I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. There is a man being sought. He had to be a kinsman of Adam. And all the shenanigans of Satan from Adam on was an attempt to break that chain. And he didn't make it, because he was linked to Adam. And he's the last Adam. Adam was the first Adam. He's the last Adam. That's one of the titles Paul uses of him. And uh, it's interesting to notice where they look for him. People miss this. They reviewed the potential inventory of possibilities in three places. No man in heaven or on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open it. Where did they look? Three places. Heaven, earth, and under the earth. Why? They're looking for the kinsman redeemer. We may be confused, but John was not. He, he, he understood what the problem was. And no man, it had to be a man, no man was found in heaven. I wept much because no man, see, the, that's a non trivial not looking for some super angel, We're looking for a man that qualifies to be the kinsman redeemer. The next verse clears it up for us. One of the elders, ooh, one of the 24 elders, it's important you need to know who they are, they re represent the redeemed officer. One of the elders saith unto him, weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, hath, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. John shook up. No man's found. He's, he's sobbing. I said, hey, wait, 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 wait. 
Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book loose seals. And he turns, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. Wow. Having seven heads, seven horns, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth on the earth. So the point is, who is this person? Jesus, absolutely, absolutely. Some of those idiots may strange with you if you haven't been through chapter one of Revelation, but we're, we're, that's another issue. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, that's clearly our Messiah. But he's showing here not as a lion, but as a lamb. Okay, he's a lamb in his first coming. He's a lion in the second coming. Okay. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Can you imagine having a day like that? Have you ever finished a day without looking back on it and wishing that you had done some things a little differently? He never had one of those days. He never had one of those days. Our Lord never finished a day with a regret. I think that's kind of impressive. And his, his statement is that he's always, he consistently claims to be the Savior of the world and so on. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Now, that's not everybody. It's those that believed on him. That's a critical question. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There's a verse. It's probably the most misapplied verse in the Bible. There are buildings all over the landscape that have that emblazoned on a cornerstone or over the mantle or whatever. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's not what he said. That's only part of what he said and we need to understand that. And uh, it, it dealing with people who believed on him and uh, believed on him, not just believed him. Believing him isn't the issue. Believing on him is a big different thing. The devils also believe and tremble, we understand. What is truth? Note the order. If you continue in my word, you shall know the truth. The truth shall, those, those are the three steps. Now, this phrase is misquoted at, on more public and private buildings than anything I can think of. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. No, that's dropping the condition up front. The whole point is missed if you leave out the first part. If ye continue in my word, ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Totally different. People, there's a lot of one-verse theology in our churches anyway, but this is something the secular world has picked up, and the United Nations, wherever, mis misapply that. I love the definition of truth. What is truth? I probably asked that question my wife in her research, going over several decades of certain word studies. She, she came up with, uh, highlighted to me, the, my favorite definition of truth. The truth is when the word and the deed become one. When his word and the deed. Predicting the Redeemer in Genesis 3 that the Lord did, fantastic. But when he appears, he can say, I am the truth. Because the word and the deed has been manifest. So that's pretty exciting. Anyway, the answer to him says, we are Abraham's, uh, Abraham's seed. And we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, we shall be made free? These guys are so misinformed, uh, it's pathetic. Such arrogance. We were never in bondage. The nation was born in bondage. They went down as a family into Egypt. They came out as a nation in what's called the Exodus from Egypt. They were, they, they were in bondage in Egypt. It didn't finish there. You go through the judges, Babylon, the Assyrian Empire, the Seleucids. In fact, right now, when they're saying this, they were under Rome's heel, screaming about it. We were never in bondage. Man, talk about being out of touch. There are other forms of bondage, though, that are even worse than those. Freedom of drugs, alcohol, sex, materialism, power. Those are bondages. No more binding than the politics. Fill in the blank on any appetite, and you'll find no freedom, only bondage. In fact, it just increases the appetite. That's how it becomes bondage. And so, the bondage of the natural man is worse than you and I can imagine. 
destitute of righteousness, we find, and goodness. These are all from the Scripture. Destitute of wisdom, full of vanity. This is the natural man. Destitute of strength and power, unable to do good, destitute of freedom, st state of bondage right on through. When I was a, a teenager starting to learn the Bible, I had a tough time with this idea, the whole idea of the, the, the depravity of man. And I, I learned it because it said so, but as I grew older and got into the world, I saw more and more it confirmed very much so. The more experience you have, wherever, whether it's in politics or business or any other, the more you see this is just true as can be. State of bondage. Under the dominion of sin. These are all, you can dig the verses out from the notes. Under Satan's dominion. That's the key to it all. People say, you're a conspiracy theorist. Absolutely. You realize who the master conspirator really is. It's not some, you know, guy in a smoke-filled room with a bunch of financiers. No, it's Satan. He's the ultimate. He's the prince of the power of the air. Getting to verse 34, he answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Very, very, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. And by the way, that's in the present tense, which means it's continuing. It's not over with. Present tense is it's continuing. If you continue in a life of sin, you are a servant of sin. A servant abideth not in the house forever, but a son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. He's making an allusion here that is very clear if you have servants. Uh, 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 you know, servants go home at night. The son doesn't. He's part of the family. So that's really the flavor that he's using here. Duolos is the term for slave. That's a, that's a, uh, a slave in theory could be expelled from the house at any time. A son is free to come and go. And Paul used this analogy, uh, slave and the son of God, in Romans 6, 7, and 8 in his epistle. He, he dwells on this idea. A servant abideth not in the house forever, but a son abideth forever. And uh, so, uh, anyway, we'll move on here. The, uh, be free indeed. Free from what? Okay. From the condemnation of sin, the penalty of the law, and the wrath of God, for starters. That's, that's a big bunch right there. From the power of Satan, that's a big one right there. And uh, from the bondage of sin itself, and uh, from the authority, from the authority of man, free to serve God. You need to understand that. And there we are. That's being free indeed. Continuing verse thirty-seven, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Ooh, now see they've had their crack at him. He's about to explain their fatherhood. They talking about his fatherhood. Okay, let me tell you about yours, guys. And uh, see, their ethnic heritage was a hindrance to their understanding, and so is ours. We need to understand that too. Seed of Abraham, yes, but the, being the seed of Abraham doesn't make them Abram's children. Not in the spirit, not in the way he's speaking here. And Paul does the same thing in Romans four and nine when he gets into those things. Jesus himself uses that distinction. You can be a seed of Abraham, but not Abraham's ch children. Okay. He speaks of heaven and paradise as Abraham's bosom. Not all seed of Abraham end up there, obviously. And so, the answer said to him, Abraham is our father. <laughs> Jesus said to them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not. Abraham. We're echoing here the you know uh, like father, like son kind of thing. They claim to be uh, of Abraham, not really. And uh, ye do the deeds of your father. <laughs> They're asking for it. Here it goes. Then said they to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. See, in the King James Bible, you, mean, you don't get the needle that they're putting in there. They're, they're calling him a, a bastard, really. This this little dialogue is not polite anymore, and, and we're going to see who gets the last word here. And so, uh, you want to be careful, by the way, it's very popular in philosophy to talk about the brotherhood of man. This is the denial of that. The brotherhood of man is a, de is a deceit of Satan. Jesus makes it quite clear that there's two kinds of people, those that are saved and those that are not. And their ethnic roots isn't the answer to that. Buckley said, when did you become a Christian? I got a new line I'm using now. I like it. I was born a Christian. 
Isn't that pretty cool? I wasn't originally born a Christian, but I was when I became born again, I became a Christian, so I was born a Christian. That stirs it up a little bit. <laughs> okay. I love that. I think it's kind of cool. Born of fornication? Oh, boy. And so this is an echo, of course, of verse 19. And, uh, and all of this is really from a springboard of saying the light of the world. This is all, see, the whole chapter is really designed. I love that. He said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. But I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? To, here's to, to, to receive and believe. They had no faith, obviously. And uh, ye, here's the one, 44, verse 44, 844, nails it. Jesus speaking, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Boy, boy, boy. There is a quote you shouldn't be aware of. Effective lies need to be big and often repeated until accepted. That's a quote from Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler. And it's very true. One of the few things in there that is true, but it's, it's very, very graphic in today's society. You look at the political spectrum, it's unbelievable, the garbage and the nonsense and so forth. It's just astonishing. Ye are of your father, the devil. All of us were in that same boat, by the way. The brother of man is a divided house, dividing the children of God and the children of Satan. That's the division. You're in one camp or the other. And their unbelief confirms this. Is there a personal devil? Is there really a guy, a, per, a personality, a person called Satan? Anyone that doubts that, try opposing him for a little while. You'll get his attention. Your father versus my father, the seed of the serpent versus the, the prince of the power of the air and all of that. He is a person. He's live and real. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 20 he talks about his origin and so forth. And uh, by the way, any time that you promote some unkind reflections on the people of God, you're doing the devil's work. That's pretty scary. It astonishes me to notice how many pastors or parent pastors on the Internet are just making disparaging, I shouldn't be polite, lies, slander, deceit about other members in ministry that they may not agree with. There is a procedure to go with witness to the board. You know, there, there, there's a procedure, Matthew 18, that tells you what you should do when you have a, a, an issue with one of your brothers. It isn't spreading lies on bulletin boards around the world. Unbelievable. Moving on, verse 45. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. And by the way, from verse 40, from the middle verse here, if any of his enemies had one shred of evidence against him, they would have used it. They couldn't. Ye are not of God. It has to do with eternal election. There's a whole theological study to get into sometime. And uh, so... From our vantage point, if you believe in God, you are saved. God already knows who are of him. We'll get more of that in chapter 10. We'll get into all of that there. Then answered the Jews and said to them, Ye uh, said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil? There's a word on word play here I'll come back to in a minute. See, if facts and logic don't work, the next, the next step is ridicule. So that's what they're about to do here. Uh, say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil? He answered, said, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. And uh, so the uh, Lord of Samaritan, uh, the, the, uh, the concept of the word Samaritan and the word demon possessed are the same word in Aramaic. And he, uh, he, and, he and he using that name for Shomeron, Shomeroni is, is an Arabic title for the devil. So there's a, there's a, they're exploiting a pun here in a sense, okay? 
Verily, verily, Jesus speaking, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Wow. Boy, is he out on limb that one. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou a greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? You can understand the secular viewpoint coming out here. He's talking about greater than Abraham. The Samaritan woman said greater than Jacob. Remember, there's a little different thing going on there in Samaria. And uh, so in jo back then. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. If it is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I should be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. This has gone beyond politeness here, hasn't it? They're going at it. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Ooh. And he saw it and was glad. Boy, that's got to be confusing them. What's that all about? Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and thou hast seen Abraham? And uh, so, fifty was the age of retirement for a Levite, by the way. That's the metaphor. He saw it. The question is when, okay? He saw it in paradise, obviously. In Luke 16, we find that out. Between the cross and the resurrection, in some spurious things, we record that. It may not be authoritative. It, they use aorist verbs, by the way, in the list I'm going to give you, which means at a specific point in time, not in some generality. It's aorist, it's at a specific point in time. By faith in Genesis 12, verse 3, prophetic view of all history in Genesis 15, and promise of Isaac, this is Abraham seeing Jesus, in other words. Genesis 17, uh, the theophany of Genesis 18. In Genesis 22, we have, of course, the Akedah, the offering of Isaac, and Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy. That's why he named the place in the Mount of the Lord as shall be seen. Many people don't pick up on Genesis 22 itself is an incredible story to spend some time on. And of course, by faith all through the scripture. Okay. He said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, get this one, this is the grand finale here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. The yach, asher, yach phrase that came out of, of course, the, the I am statement, if you will, from Exodus 3. Before him, ego I me in the Greek. Let's take a look at it in Exodus 3. And Moses said to God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, I shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? God said unto Moses, where he announces his name. I am that I am. Ichyach asher ichyach. That he said... Thou shalt thus uh, shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. That's the name of God. Yehovah. Most rabbis won't pronounce it, so they'll spell it. Four letters. And yod he vav he. yod he vav he. They'll just use the letters because they don't want to pronounce his name. They feel that's not appropriate. So they'll often, stay, when that comes up in the Torah, they'll substitute the word Adonai, Lord. They don't want to pronounce the Tetragrammaton. And if you and it's a, a Yahweh or Yehovah. And, but in the, in the German, the J is like a Y, so it says Jehovah because they don't understand it came from German. But anyway, it's, if you want to pronounce it, Yehovah, Yehovah, Yahweh, those are all guesses by scholars. We're not sure. But the, the, the rabbinical thing, just use the letters. Yod, He, Vav, He. But anyway, I am, the, I am that I am. That I am sent me. Now, you, whenever you and I run the risk of missing a point, the Pharisees come to our rescue. When they're upset, that's the Holy Spirit's way of underlining, hey, this is important. Pay attention. And so, uh, whenever we don't understand the context, the Pharisees make it clear for us. And uh, so, uh, that was, uh, and by the way, the, they're in the temple and it's on a Sabbath day that all this is occurring. Can you imagine? And not by profligates or public growth. This is by the orthodoxy in the temple doing this. What did they do? They took up stones to cast at him. They tried to stone him. Why? Because they understood what he was saying. He claimed to be the voice of the burning bush. And that was all they could handle. They, they didn't, were legally allowed to stone anymore. Rome had the death penalty. They didn't care. They're ready to stone him. He slips away. This happened several times. I, I'd love to know how he really did. I don't know how, if you're a movie director, what you do with this scene exactly. 
is, he said, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. That's not very helpful for a shooting script, is it? I mean, okay, but uh, pretty exciting. Okay, they took up stones to kill. That's, that, 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 that's proof that they understood stoning for blasphemy and reveals how blinded they were. And the, by the way, the word cast there implies that some had actually thrown some. In the Greek, it's in, in place they not, they not were about to, they started in effect. And uh, so we got three choices before we wrap it up here. He, he, the man we're talking about, is one of three things. He either isn't God and doesn't know that he's not God, so he's a lunatic. That's one possibility. Or he isn't God, but he knows he's not God. That makes him a liar. Three possibilities. Either a lunatic, doesn't know that he's not God, or he knows he's not God, but he's pretending to be, so he's a liar. There's a third possibility, that he is. Three L's. He's either a lunatic, a liar, or a lord. Take your pick. Your decision doesn't in any way change who he is. He is the great I am, the Yehovah, the yod the eternal God himself. He's the one that created the six days of Genesis. He's the one that's going to come back as a man. He's still a man today, by the way. He didn't come man for a little while. He had to take that on. There's an anecdote. I'll save that for another time because we're running a lot here. Your decision that you're going to make is either to accept or deny that. You're in this one, in one path or the other. And uh, so whose child are you? It's a question you need to work out for yourself. And so chapter 8 began with the Jews attempting to stone a sinful woman and to catch Jesus in a trap. This chapter ended where they tried to stone a sinless Messiah because they were caught in their own trap. So with that, let's, for the next session, I'd like you to prepare by studying John chapter 9. It's about a blind man that's healed. But it's, just a not, it's not just another miracle. What I want you to do is study, for before, before the next time, just read chapter 9, and when you do, I want you to find yourself described in this chapter and the implications of that. That's a perspective of that chapter that may seem strange to you now. Go through and read it once, and then go back and read it and try to figure out how, what are the implications for you of this guy that was blind and was healed, born blind and healed. What's going on here? What are the parallels? What's the lesson? What, why is the Holy Spirit going to have you read that chapter? That's the question of the day. And with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for bringing us here and giving us your word and your Holy Spirit to open it to our lives. We do pray that we too can enjoy the benefits of being in your forever family, that we too will be your children, and that we too are called to serve you as we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen.